exploding myths to do with mm -hmm. fluid. Now there are there are plenty of myths. One of the most sort of mundane ones that I, I'm always drawn to is this this strange idea that has grown up over time that Floyd were completely faceless and that nobody knew what they looked like. Now I think it kind of started round about the kind of dark side, wish you were here kind of era. It's really interesting because when you actually look back through the catalogue, I mean, if, if we just start with their first album. Yep. Not really a particularly faceless band, is it? <laughs> now I can see a dozen or so in there. If you move on then to... Yeah. It's a fairly conspicuous photograph of David Gilmour on the cover. I mean, you're not kind of squinting. Going, is that a picture of the band? It's what, then, another 16 or 20 of them on there, isn't it? Yeah, and then, but I think, I think this one is my favourite, because you get to medal, and then you kind of go... Yeah. Even when you get to this album, which is the one that everybody says, ah, yes, but this is the one where, you know, there was nothing to tell you what they look like. If you just reach inside the um, the cover, there they are. Yeah, yeah. I do love seeing you've still got that poster looking <laughs> minty fresh. <too. laughs> I wish I could claim credit for it. This is a copy that was given to me quite recently by somebody. My copy, the poster, is oh. long as long gone. Um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, to me, that's a great example of of these kind of myths that will accrue around a band like Floyd, you know, the enigma, the fact that they were never on their album covers, the fact that nobody knew what they looked like, and yet you can just easily pull all these records. From from Wish You Were Here onwards, I think that's where that starts. Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall, Final Cut, none of them yeah. have any images whatsoever. I do know what you mean about the uh, the faceless uh, element you know and there's always that classic line and by the way which one's pink that kind of almost feeds that myth uh, mm. to a degree and and it's something I assume that they would have embraced perhaps it's the uh, hypnosis effect you know the fact that mm. there's such a strong visual element you know that they're putting on a, a, a visual experience in the show that they really don't need to rely on that but you know, I think your examples there is a healthy enough amount of ego to want their their faces sort of in there. And there's something, when you put the uh, metal fold out, there's actually something quite naked and charming. Um, not literally naked, but they're just, mm. they look like jobbing musos, you know what I mean? Like they could have been a pub, pub rock band or something like that. I was going to make that exact same point. When they were photographed, they tended to just have very mundane photographs of themselves. They didn't try to make themselves look like anything. They were just these guys, just, you know, very normal. I mean, when they did um, Momentary Lapse of Reason, they chose the most, the, just the blandest photograph of David Gilmore and Nick Mason inside. It almost looked like just a couple of executives just kind of sat there, you know. <laughs> And it was like, really? What? This is Pink Floyd? Right, okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> there was no attempt, I think, because they know that they don't have any particular, you know, rock star charisma or any uh, anything impressive of themselves, you know, as a kind of image-wise. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting how they just, they always seemed to me when I was growing up to be these very mysterious, godlike figures, very kind of faceless. But Floyd are probably the most kind of not like that, really, of all the bands from that era. They're just just some very regular normal guys aren't they unassuming in so far as um mm. putting out a, a marketable image or using themselves as a marketable image they're anti that and rather rely on the artwork to speak i suppose which is does feed into that myth maybe mm. you know? yeah i think i think floyd album art does that's really kind of one of their big big major contributions i guess to the kind of culture of rock music isn't it i mean absolutely yeah, yeah and and that kind of touches a little bit on i think one of the points i may i was going to make on this one in terms of you know whether pink floyd still have a relevance or that one of the ones i see where it's most in terms of a sound bite or a visual grab dark side you'll still see that today on teenagers walls or shirts and things like that 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 whole complete package of art and music and things is just something so immediate about it that 
still grabs people almost 50 years later. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they were just totally iconic. They, I mean, they absolutely got, didn't they, that, um, that you need that kind of incredibly distinctive visual hook and they were just lucky enough to have these friends from Cambridge who just had a genius for, for devising these just these mysterious, enigmatic, incredibly emblematic images. That I mean, the dark side thing just came out of a textbook. It was just from a physics textbook. There was nothing designed. It, I mean, there was nothing about the actual image itself which had been created or, you know, shepherded into existence by anybody. It was just, let's just get this picture from a textbook and stick it on the front of the album. It's amazing really mm, mm. yeah and then i suppose working in in sync with them you know the the um wish you were here is a cover for me that sort of continues mm. to deliver i can look at that and sort of get lost in those themes of absence and mm. loss sort of sitting there in the images you know beautifully composed and set mm. um yeah and and, and i compared to a lot of other uh, rock albums at the time. Sure, there were a lot of other art statements and it was mm. probably the prime era for an art statement, but uh, you did get the feeling some of them were corporate or dashed off or, mm. you know, haphazard. Uh, these were things that had gravity, you know. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would stick my neck out on this and say that Wish You Were Here, the album Wish You Were Here, is the most perfect symbiosis of album artwork and music ever in the history of rock music. I mean, just as you say, the choice of images. I mean, I'm thinking of the, you know, say the red veil in the, yeah, you know, in the woods. I mean, I would listen to Shine On You Crazy Diamond, you know, the first few minutes of that and just look at the picture of the, of the red veil with the dark mm. tree line behind it. And it was almost like this is just one experience that I'm having. It's not that I'm listening to music and, and looking at a picture. This is actually one unified experience of some kind that these guys wow. have managed to create. It was just like, yeah, this is the music. This is the image. It's the same thing. It's the same. That's a pretty difficult thing to Powerful. do. It's a pretty difficult thing to get right, isn't it? That's one interesting thing about Floyd is that they came from Cambridge, from this incredibly um, artistic, intellectual, left-wing kind of environment where so many minds were kind of attuned to kind of similar creative impulses and similar outlooks and a similar kind of intellectual or aesthetic perspective that when they were ready to yep. just launch themselves globally it was like that just the whole package there's nothing needed to be done by any record executive it yep. could all just be done in-house just with these just these guys who knew each other inside out and back to front yeah, very powerful thing to have to build each other up, I guess, that way. I mean, that that's a question I guess I'd want to put to you is how do you, <laughs> it's like almost too much to put in a, in one question. What are some ways you in, envisage uh, Pink Floyd being, I don't know, accepted, consumed or, or understood into the future is there any things that you think that mm. they have now that are you know could resonate in future to a different audience a younger audience or well they do they they do always seem to have been able to do that i mean if you take it as an historical precedent floyd have always appealed to young people you know teenagers people in their early 20s it seems to be music which speaks to young people I mean, Roger Waters himself, he kind of, he characterised his lyrics on Dark Side. I think he said something like, you know, they're very lower sixth. Uh, and what he meant by that, it, it's just that kind of slight, it's like not quite poetry. It's almost like doggerel. It's the kind of thing that you might yeah. write as a kind of very sensitive, overly emotional 16 year old. You've started to do a bit of reading here and there, but you haven't really pieced anything together. You've got no kind of grand overarching theory of life yet, but you're starting to maybe tap into the idea that there might be theories out there and that there might be ways of understanding the world, which can be knitted together into something cogent but you haven't quite found it. And I think Floyd's music appeals on that level because it's very emotional. And that's something I've always, I've never quite understood people saying that Floyd's music isn't emotional. To me, it's, mm. it's very emotional. It's got the blues in it. It's got soul in it. It's got jazz in it. It's got gospel in it. It's very sensual. It's very beautiful. Yep. 
and it's informed by lots of different things aesthetically and lyrically it's just it you get this sense of someone almost taking baby steps you know someone very intelligent someone who's got a lot of insight trying to make sense of the world trying to piece things together in some way not quite managing to do it getting angry with himself and frustrated with himself and finally almost lashing out against himself maybe um, but maybe that's yep. what seems to appeal to the kind of young mind it's and maybe that's what perhaps that's what will see them mm. through to future generations and if we go back to uh, just quickly that that quote you uh, had of, of roger saying lower six it it's almost feels uh, self-effacing or modest of himself in that way mm. um you know I, I do know what you mean the, the lyrics he could do then maybe aren't as nuanced as you know is this what the life we really want or some of his more recent work or even compared to say um the final cut or something like that but as you say there's there's something of a universal experience and and an an attempt to encapsulate elements of human nature in there you know mm -hmm. that that it's hard not to resonate regardless of the time uh, mm. that it's made or or being heard in you know yeah, it seemed like a conscious attempt to try and go for something universal. I think from metal onwards, you know, from echoes onwards, he tries to start writing things which are almost kind of built to last. He's trying to, he's trying to find some statements about himself and the world which will actually have resonance. And he was a fan of John Lennon. I think he admired Lennon's way of, of, of you know, writing songs and writing lyrics mm. which were going to have resonance. I, I guess at times where I'm frustrated with him, the directness to me can tend towards um, didacticism, you know, just mm. almost being too obvious and spelling something out rather than leaving some gaps and some mystery in between them. Um, but mm. yeah, that time in the, the early 70s, um, he pretty much gets that mix spot on. Yeah, I mean, that's why I've got such a fondness for that kind of early period. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Sid Barrett, so I love the, you know, I love Piper, but I do, I've, I do have, have a fondness for that, that kind of floundering era, you know, the kind of era where they're trying to find some way of working or some way of operating and Roger's trying to find his voice. I find it very sweet somehow and the music from that period, mm. I find it very utopian and very, um, there's that great yeah. story there about how they were trying to record a cymbal crash and it took all four of them to do it. I can't quite recall the details, <laughs> but it, it took one of them to sort of hold it on the floor, one of them to do something with the stand, one of them to actually hit the cymbal with a stick and one of them to do something else. I can't remember, but I just love that kind of, just that kind of image of these four. I feel like guys. You, <laughs> you were setting up for a Floyd joke then. How many Floyds does it take to hit, take a, to, to hit a cymbal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a great point. And even the other day, uh, spinning Adam Hart Mother, I always had a real fondness for a song like um, um, If, his dalliance with a groupie, but where he's, he's actually asking, mm. I would just like to know, how do you feel? You know, it's a very, very interesting uh, sort of thing to be continuing to ask a stranger sort of thing, that trying to find that, Mm. connection in a very naive way but also a very adult mm. way there's just a, mm. a hint of sadness in there but also mm. mystery and that sort of thing it, it is a lovely era yeah i just wanted to quickly address an area that i've always been well not always been uncomfortable with but increasingly over the years is the floyd's treatment of sid barrett and i think we've talked already a lot about their mythos or their sense of enigma or this i mean floyd are a band with such a complex history aren't they they've got this backstory mm. makes them very compelling and you've got this figure of sid barrett who's this great you know creative force and then he falls and then his absence kind of almost goes on to define the band in later years they're kind of trying to make sense of his absence and trying to make sense of okay well what yeah. do we actually do now then how do we actually continue and the one thing that I've always found a bit uncomfortable is the way that they have possibly traded on that quite deliberately it's almost like they've realized we've got this story here <clears throat> which really makes us a lot more interesting than we would otherwise have been <laughs> if we hadn't if this yeah. hadn't happened yeah. 
the Floyd story would be a hell of a lot less interesting. Again, it's such a good question. Now, they're, they're just so closely intertwined. I, I absolutely get what you mean in terms of it, it almost feeling like trading on or exploitative in that sense. But maybe even what you were saying earlier about them trying to make sense of it in their own minds, you know, whether talking to the press or through the music, up to a certain point, I wonder whether by, um, I mean, had they even put Sid and his his influence to bed by the wall? I'm not sure. There could be bits of Sid in there by then. Mm. Um, perhaps as perhaps part of it, they realised, as you said, for later on, they have that backstory, and and it does. We need to pay some sort of service to that mention Sid and sort of trot out the stories and that sort of a thing. I think early on it felt a lot more organic or genuine in terms of grieving while at the same time, you know, playing the devil's hand or whatever the phrase is in terms of saying, well, look, we had a chance between petering out or going for broke, mm. or, you know, and, and for self-preservation, for greed, whatever it is, we've chosen this way and we have to muddle our way through it somehow, you know? Yeah, I think at some point they, they clearly realise we've come a certain way along this road now, so it's too late to turn back. We can't now uh, stop talking about Sid. We can't, you know, pretend that it never happened. Um, so, and it's quite nice, I guess. I mean, which was the show? Was it, at, um, it was the Live 8 show, wasn't it? Where they actually had a huge picture of his face on the screen. Um, yeah, okay. When they reformed to do the Live 8 performance. I thought that was quite nice. It was like, let's actually bring Sid into this. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm looking, and, and the way I've characterised it is, is when they realised they were at a point to um, really preserve his legacy and certainly his his life outside of the Floyd, whether or not they really wanted any um, uh, acknowledgement or recognition externally, I think they just genuinely at, at, at a point sometime in the 80s were like, let's cover a song of his, let's get an mm. a thing on the album, get the royalties flowing. We don't, you know, we, we can look after him this way, you know what I mean? And I think... Mm. In that essence, I, I always take them as quite a benevolent um, uh, set of ex-bandmates for Sid. But I absolutely get where you're coming from in terms of there being that real tension of are we trading off this uh, misery as well? Yeah, I mean, there's something very Floydian itself, I guess, about that ambiguity. It's <laughs> like it, would, it could only be Pink Floyd that could, you know, give rise to this kind of emotional kind of ambiguity it's like you know are we are we exploiting him or are we are we celebrating him what what what, what exactly are we doing here you know it sounds like something which roger waters needs to write a concept <laughs> album about in order to make sense of it I th in fact, i think he did didn't he? i think he actually did do that probably perhaps the wall was him trying to at least partly <laughs> kind of make sense of all that you know i mean he has bob geldof coming out of the shower doesn't he in the wall movie with his head shaved and his yeah. eyebrows shaved so clearly you know, they were trying, well, Roger was trying to make sense of it all and trying to get some kind of perspective on it, make sense of it. I, I really like to think that Sid's latter life, you know, at least the last decade, that uh, he, he would have found quite a degree of peace, I would say. I don't, I've just been listening, there was a podcast, not a podcast, it was a BBC something in the studio and they're actually taking master tapes uh, it's up on youtube now but it happened about 10 years ago and they're just sort of showing through the um sort of isolating tracks in the master tapes just what the magic i suppose of, of gilmore and and Wright is doing and the one thing i never picked up on was um the vocals how they're constantly doing a, a, a melody and harmony vocal mm. with each other and they have a certain vocal blend to them. Do you, you know, actively listen out for those sorts of uh, parts in Floyd albums, uh, particularly what the vocals are doing, whether there are multi-track guitars going on or, or what sort of uh, keyboard uh, progression or even 
you know interestingly going on there no i'd say probably not no with pink floyd my ear tends to be not very analytical um and maybe i've not even brought that into my full consciousness <laughs> yet i mean there are some <laughs> bands when i well i do do that interestingly when i kind of hear you know certain types of music maybe perhaps things that are a bit proggier you know things like yes you know, I might find myself going, oh, it's, it's quite interesting how Steve Howe's guitar is doing that whilst Rick Wakeman's keyboard's yep. doing that. You know, there's something kind of happening there. Whereas Floyd, for some reason, I, it tends to just be this all-inclusive kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Not to say that there's, I mean, there's, there's definite moments on Floyd records that I think are absolutely magical yeah. because of the musicianship. So I'm thinking of like Rick Wright's keyboard intro into Sheep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could happily have that on a loop forever, <laughs> you know, I mean... <laughs> It is just, I, I can't even describe how sublime it is. Just the way it's just such a simple little melody, almost childlike, but you know what's coming. It's going to go into this tortured, dark, ominous, horrific diatribe. And, but he starts it. And I've always found it quite ironic that Rick Wright said, I didn't really like animals because I didn't really feel like I had much of a place on that album. He, he loved mm. Wish You Were Here because that's the album where he and Gilmore do have all the very explicit musical, you know, counterpoints and kind of thing. Whereas on, on um, animals, I think Rick Wright felt that he was kind of surplus to requirements. And I think he felt that his parts didn't quite belong. Whereas I'd say actually on animals, the stuff he does with Gilmore on that record is really, really interesting. All that kind of ominous, all those ominous passages in Dogs, where you've got this organ just, just doing stuff, just endlessly, just nearly finding melodies and then just drifting back off into <laughs> abstract stuff again. And, and Gilmore's like yeah, lurking, yeah. he's lurking all the time. You know, Rick, Rick's lurking and Gilmore's lurking as well. And you, you're just sort of watching them and waiting for them to do something. And then the, yeah. and in, in, um, in Sheep, it's so wonderful when they finally do something. It's really spectacular at the end, you know, so. Yeah, but that, I mean, that description alone, James, makes me want to run off and <laughs> put, put animals on right now. Um, it almost makes you, makes you a liar out of yourself when you're saying you, you hear it as an overall thing because you're also... Mm in that instance anyway, definitely mm. hearing what they're well, doing maybe, with each other. Maybe it's because Animals doesn't have any reverb on it. I think there was this thing, there's this constant battle in the studio between Roger and Dave, wasn't there, about do we put reverb on this or not? I know they had it on Dark Side, <laughs> they had it on Comfortably Numb. Roger was always like, no, no, dry, let's have everything dry. And Gilmore's always going, no, no, let's put some reverb on it. And when, once the reverb goes down onto tracks such as Us and Them and Time, yep. it, does, it does sort of turn into a bit of a soup in a way yes yeah yeah which is very much what you're saying in like it's that immersive sound which is almost a trademark of theirs rather than looking for a virtuosic element they're in there but mm. it's this overall soup of warmth and and just gloriousness to sort of luxuriate in mm. uh when they're at their best but yeah that's a great point about the tension with <laughs> you know the dryness versus the wetness i think i was looking at that uh, same doco that mm. um with the multi-tracks there and and they're saying um you know everything here comes the reverb now you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> um here are the effects that that go on over the top of it mm. everything at this point is going through a leslie speaker you know mm. um uh, but it's yeah, I don't know. It's it's a lovely thing to, like I said, luxuriate in as mm. well. I don't think Floyd were um, players in the sense that other bands of their time were. I mean, they were not. I mean, Gilmore is Gilmore's a stylist. He's he, you know he's got he's wonderful at being David Gilmore. Nick Mason is a fairly limited drummer. He was he was nothing like um, Robert Wyatt from the Soft Machine. I mean, they were the band that were around in in London on the same scene. As Floyd in the 60s. I mean, you know, I mean, Wyatt is just is completely on a different level. You know, he, he's a jazz drummer, he, you know, he can do anything. Mason can basically do th maybe three or four fills and he just does them in every <laughs> song. It's just, it's like sort of Keith Moon, but slowed down. It's just the same, <laughs> it's just the same thing, isn't it, really? Roger Waters is a very plunky bass player, really. He doesn't really have a lot of fluidity. He, he tends to, yeah, plunk, yeah. He plunks away on the root notes a lot. Um, on um, animals, actually, but then you, but then you do have I, Rick Wright, who, who is, 
he's the one that's kind of like he's got the jazz background he's got the miles davis chords you get the feeling that he's the one that actually is floyd's kind of dream ticket yeah yeah and and as an older listener compared to my um like getting into them as a teenager I sort of hear now quite a lot of empathy in in how Rick Wright approaches his playing, you know, Mm. very much working out what the song needs or where it can fit and fill in between, never really to make a show of it, but just to bring everything else up and, you know, knit it all together. There's some wonderfully intuitive sort of playing in there. Mm. Um, you know, I wish I had technical terms for what he does, but mm. it's it's really lovely stuff, you know. I think I think Gilmore and Wright knew that they were special because towards the end of Rick Wright's life, he was back playing with Dave Gilmore again. And there's some wonderful footage of them playing together in, in um, Dave's barn. He's got this really amazing yep. barn where they just, you know, absolutely <laughs> idyllic and... Um, I think Rick. I think Rick and David Gilmore knew that they had something special going on. Uh, I think, you know, I think Gilmore knew that when he got the Floyd back together in '87 or whatever it was, he knew that. Yeah. You know, he needed to have Rick Wright back on board. Really, he couldn't really do Floyd just with himself, Nick Mason, and a lot of session musicians. Yeah. You know, he had to have Rick Wright in there. And my memory of seeing Floyd live in '87 because uh, they they opened the show with um, Crazy Diamond. And mm. when when Rick Wright's organ chords came in and the spotlight picked him out on the keyboard, there was the most enormous roar from the audience. Yeah. It was truly, I mean, Gilmore got his roar. <laughs> you know, when he comes yeah, in on the yeah. guitar, when his thing, okay, so big roar for Which Gilmore. Ex- expected. Which yeah, you yeah. sort of expect that, but, but a big, big roar for Rick Wright when that keyboard comes in. And what's so incongruous is it, it's not like he comes in with this big, da-da, you know, <laughs> I'm here now, it's you know. Very, Rick, yeah, it's just this slow, stately. yeah, a slow fade in organ chord and the, and the entire stadium <laughs> is like, <laughs> again, that's pretty special, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it does not uh, fail to deliver that first gig of yours, I tell you what. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think Nick Mason now, got much of a roar when he came in, but, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> <It's a drama. laughs> you're, you're used to it, aren't you? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I was pleased to see him, but, um, yeah. <laughs> now, I've got one last question I just thought of uh, fairly off the cuff. Okay. Uh, I've got a visual answer here, but for you, what would you say is, when did Floyd peak? When did they, for you, reach, you know, the the essence or the, the best of everything that they... Uh, did and would go on to do well i've always i've always had a soft spot for comfortably numb the song yep um i'd say if you force me to give an answer i'd say that's the last truly great thing that they did together because it was such yep. a meeting point between what dave gilmore had to offer and what roger had to offer the way it goes from the verses into the choruses the lyric the delivery the fact that you've got roger and dave and david you know doing take it in turns and then you've got this guitar solo and there's something about the track it's just a very beautiful track and um i think i don't think they did anything as good as that again if you i mean if you're talking about albums that's a trickier question i mean i i've always seen dark side as the last truly representative floyd album in a way because as soon as they do dark side they start to break up essentially so even though Wish You Were Here's got some great stuff on it. It's the sound of a band who've kind of, they've sort of had enough now and they're, they're, they're going to try and make another album, you know. Um, <laughs> whereas Dark Side is, is, is the last thing they do together where they're, they're all pulling together. They're all singing from the same hymn sheet. They've all got the same collective goal. They all agree in the studio and they know what they want to do. And they just do this album for the ages, you know. What's your take on that question? Yeah, mine's pretty close. I mean, I, I think I re- reached a peak, or not a peak, I, I reached kind of the, uh, you know, idea a while back, uh, a, a couple of years ago or so, that this is a bootleg of um, raving and drooling. So this is uh, Floyd Live in 74. 
I think I've heard that. I think a version of this, yeah, some of this came out on the Wish You Were Here um, uh, expanded edition. I don't know if this concert exactly, but so you've got the um, raving and drooling, you know, the songs that would go on to be dogs and sheep for animals, but three years before the, um, uh, before animals is released and you haven't even got Wish You Were Here released yet. As you say, they've reached that, you know, absolute mountain and they kind of realised that after um, Dark Side broke that they could feasibly be spent at that point. But they're saying, well, there's, in a way, there's one more mountain just over there that you could climb, you know. And and this has still got, to me, that sort of, that hunger and drive in there, mm. um, right in that peak time of just beautiful playing intuitive that works with each other but they've still got something as, as masterful as um you know wish you were here to be delivered while they're sort of working their way through um what yeah. would become animals i think it's just mm. a beautiful sort of time in their life in the face of all of that uh, adversity that they must have even been feeling the weight of everything at that point yeah, I mean, Floyd did a good job, I think, of prolonging, you know, that, uh, I mean, I mean, they could have done really terrible things after Dark Side. They could, I mean, they, they could have done Dark Side Part 2. They could have totally, lost, yeah, I mean, if you imagine a parallel world where they kind of went back to the floundering again, that's yep. horrific to contemplate. If you imagine after Dark Side, they went back and did another Umma Gummer, another Atom Art Mother, it'd be like, oh my God, no. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they kind of held their nerve enough to kind of realize, no, no, we found, we found the thing that works now. We can't repeat that. We definitely can't go back to doing what we were doing before it. <laughs> but, so we need to find a way of yeah. evolving this now. And despite all yeah. the dreadful problems that they gradually started to have, um, they, I think you're right. I think they did manage to do some really spectacular work. And I do think I perhaps need to go back and reassess again now i feel like there's been too many years now where i've stuck to this kind of dogma that i've got of you know oh floyd they kind of went a bit sour from wish you were here onwards i think perhaps i do need to revisit those records now maybe listen to them in order or something and actually try and get some sense again of the continuum of it you know it's just when i get mm. to the wall i just need to find a way of getting past <laughs> disc one <laughs> i can just Man. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do a Zoom listening to coach each other through mm, it, you know? Maybe, maybe, yeah. <laughs> if I could find some way of having the disc play at twice the speed, maybe I could listen to the second disc. It's uh, 45 <laughs> RPM or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very gratifying to hear you at least plump for Comfortably Numb as one of those uh, peak moments, even within an mm. album that you sort of uh, find a harder one to... Oh, yeah, I mean... To that track is absolutely undeniable. I've, I've got this great memory years ago of being on holiday in uh, Cyprus with my parents. And we were staying in, a, in an apartment in Cyprus and we had to go and visit the, um, the landlord, you know, the guy who owned this apartment <laughs> for some reason. I can't remember why. And we went to his house and he had these, uh, these two beautiful um, daughters, Cypriot girls. They were about 16, 17 and they were just like, I can't even describe, you know, just visions of absolute <laughs> beauty. I think I was yeah. about 15 and they were 16, 17 kind of thing, you know, and they were just, just these Cypriot girls. Couldn't speak English all that well, but they could speak it okay. And we got talking about music and I asked them what they liked and they said, ah, we'll go and play something. And they went and got a cassette and they brought it and played it for me and it was comfortably numb. And we sat and listened to this song and they were just saying how incredible it was and how beautiful it was. And it was such an amazing moment for me because I was a massive Floyd fan at that age, 15. Yeah. You know, and it just it kind of made me realise how Floyd's music had just translated across cultures. And I, mm. I, you know, I don't think these teenage girls had any conception at all as to what the song was about or what the history was. They probably didn't even understand the words of it. Yeah. <laughs> but they could yeah. hear that it was this, this spectacularly beautiful thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great, great example. Uh, to me, that is teenage boy <laughs> listening in excelsis in a way you know so to mm. hear that story to hear it cut across mm. you know genders language and everything like that mm. it is down to the music speaking 
what could be better than that? Mm. Cool. All right, Dean. Well, thank you very much for that very illuminating discussion. I'm trying to think if thank I actually you, got... Did I get through all my points? I think I did. I think I did. There might have been one or two things, but I mean, we can always do a sequel. <laughs> I'm more than happy to do that. Yeah, or, or on other um, bands. I'm just trying to think what else we can cross over on. Geordie Waddy next time, maybe? We'll see anyway. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, thanks very much for watching. Leave some comments below and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Cheers.